for you. Okay. All right. Again, welcome to the Perrinville Watershed. Um, tonight, I am with David Jackson, who's the Community Conservation Program Manager at the district. And my name is Kari Quas, and I'm the Community Engagement Project Manager at the district. And um, the two of us work together mainly on city type contracts where there's some sort of an urban environment. Um, but he's the one that gets them in the ground and helps lead that. And I help promote and do the um, communication side of it all. And tell you all about it. Next slide, David. Thanks. So tonight we have the Q and A at the bottom. Please uh, ask questions there as they come to mind. I'll be reading those off to David. And if anything um, it is pertinent to the slide he's on, then I'll just ask the question. Otherwise, we'll just have a Q and A session at the end. Okay. Next slide. So what is a conservation district? Um, for those that arrived early, we have um, we got a little tidbit of what we do. But in short, uh, we are a subagent of the state government. We are one of 45 conservation districts across the state of Washington. Loosely, they follow um, county lines and um, kind of land development. So Camano Island is a part of our district as well. We help with best practices to save natural resources, protect water quality, and we work with livestock, people on their pasture management, uh, where we're talking tonight, that low impact development, rain gardens and such. And we also have a habitat team that does more with salmon recovery and living with beavers and all kinds of good stuff on that front. We do youth and adult education. Most of that has been in person at points, uh, but this last year has really shown us we can do stuff online, which can make it easier for people to join in. So that's been good, but we can't wait to get back out there. And we're non-regulatory, so we're the good people. Um, so upcoming events, uh, that looks a little funky, but um, our event calendar has a bunch of stuff. It seems like as soon as we flip the calendar over, we just opened up um, opportunities for all kinds of different things. Two things I wanted to point out, though. One, Derek Hahn on David's team will be talking at the end of the month at Country Living Expo, which is also going to be online this year. So he'll be talking about uh, rain catchment for agricultural properties at that. And also our plant sale is open. And so if you want plants, now is the time to buy them. Um, some have sold out, that happens and that's okay. We'll do it again next year, but we're not adding any more stock for this year's sale, but pre-order so that way you can drive through and pick them up at the end of February. Next slide. Really for this, um, we have a lot of partners uh, that help us do all of our work. Certainly we are as I think David mentioned beforehand, we have rates so that people pay them on our, their property taxes to the district, but also we're funded by the Washington State Conservation Commission. And in this project that he's going to be talking about today, also Department of Ecology, the United States um, Environmental Protection Agency, the EPA, our Veterans Conservation Corps crew did the work, and then obviously the city of Edmonds, because that's where we're located. So we're grateful for everyone who helps us get these projects in the ground. So with that, I will pass it over to David. Hi, right. thank you very much, Kari. And thanks everyone for showing up tonight. This is, um, <clears throat> I, I gotta tell you, I'm excited about this one because I decided uh, sometime early this week that this was going to be a far more chill kind of, um, uh, kind of, kind of seminar. Um, I think a lot of us have been doing really kind of jam packed seminars um, recently where, you know, you have 30 minutes, you cram as much in as possible. Um, so I very purposely did a little bit less than um, uh, uh, a little bit less content uh, with the uh, intention that I would kind of touch on some stuff. We'd maybe get a little bit far afield, but then I would make sure that I answered your guys' questions. Um, whatever kind of questions you guys have about green stormwater infrastructure, rain gardens, the Perrinville watershed, um, if I have the answers, we will make sure that we get those to you. So the first, uh, first thing we're going to talk about is stormwater and runoff. We have one of my favorite little uh, graphs, graphs here about what happens in kind of a normal, um, uh, uh, on the right, a normal sort of forested area, um, and then what happens in more urban areas. So as you can see, um, the amount of runoff is dramatically increased. And runoff is water that hits a surface, and instead of infiltrating or evapotranspirating, uh, runs off into a local waterway. 
Um, evapotranspiration, for anybody interested um, in the science behind it, is a combination of transpiration and evaporation. Evaporation is when water um, goes into the air, and transpiration is when it is respirated by plants and also it goes into the air. So evapotranspiration is a combination of those two things. Infiltration is the opposite of either of those, um, and it is uh, when water sinks into the ground. Um, when it goes either into deep soils or into shallow soils. When it goes into shallow soils, it tends to show back up in water bodies, um, usually in streams. When it goes into deep soils, um, it'll sometimes get tied up in aquifers. And then runoff is uh, what is the, the other part of that, it's surface water. So water falls from the sky, hits a surface, hits an impervious surface, um, and then it runs off into a local waterway. The reason that this is not necessarily great um, is because a lot of impervious surfaces like your roofs or uh, sidewalks, roads, driveways, parking lots, things like that um, are what we call uh, pollutant generating surfaces, meaning that they have things on them that are pollutants and that water running off of it picks up those pollutants and then carries them into waterways. So you get issues um, like one that's been really big recently is talking about tire rubber. There's a specific molecule in tire rubber um, which is leading to uh, mass coho die off. And uh, when water runs over surfaces, it will pick up things like that, uh, that molecule in tire rubber, and it will deposit it into local waterways, um, some of which are salmon habitats. So we want to be careful about uh, runoff, and we want to try to manage runoff as much as possible. So green stormwater infrastructure. There's a wonderful picture from our friends at, oh no, I accidentally cut off the, uh, uh, 10,000 Rain Gardens uh, logo. I am so I will, I will um, apologize to Aaron Clark personally. Um, they uh, these uh, this is a, a wonderful picture of a functioning uh, a rain garden that standing water is what we call ponding and that is good. That means that the water is not running off into one of the storm drains. It's staying put. Um, rain gardens and green stormwater infrastructure in general allows us to model the more natural watershed. So. Uh, what you saw on the right hand side where it lands, it stays in place instead of running off and it soaks into the ground or uh, evapotranspirates. So things, uh, green soil water infrastructure includes things like rain gardens and bioswales. A uh, typical way to di differentiate rain gardens versus bioswales is rain gardens are very, um, are often private. Um, you could have one in your yard, whereas bioswales or uh, what we sometimes call uh, bioinfiltration complexes, which are combinations of rain gardens and bioswales, are more public projects that are on the side of the roads. Um, rain gardens can be either public or private, but you typically find smaller rain gardens on private property or larger rain gardens on um, either uh, public facing or public property. So just um, I want to note again, uh, this rain garden that has all the water there, um, I think a lot of the photos that I've seen of rain gardens are of them bone dry, um, and that is not a rain garden sort of typical state. Um, it's what they look like probably 80% of the time, but when you get a really good heavy rain like we've had recently, um, they do fill up, so to speak. Um, and once they get this water in there, that's okay. The plants, um, the soil is going to take up that, that water um, and it is going to hold it. The plants are gonna use some of it and the rest of it will infiltrate down into um, either the shallow or deep soils. So the Perrinville watershed, um, you may live in it, you may live near it, you may not know that it exists. Um, you may have heard of the town of Perrinville and wonder, is that the same thing as the Perrinville watershed? Almost. Uh, the Perrinville watershed is, um, uh, well, a watershed in general is an area that drains to a specific water body. So in this case, uh, Perrinville Creek. So all of this area spanning through the city of Linwood and the city of Edmonds, um, all of this is uh, um, drains to Perrinville Creek, which then discharges to Puget Sound. Um, Perrinville Watershed has some impacted waterways. Uh, we determine impacted waterway is a determination made by the Department of Ecology and the EPA. And it means that there is uh, some kind of um, uh, uh, pollutant or issue that is keeping this waterway from being the best it can be. Uh, now, I know you might be thinking, of course, all of these waters are going to not be the best that they can be because they live, you know, they're in urbanized areas. And that's true, but the criteria um, is usually very specific. We use what's called the benthic invertebrate 
biological index or BIBI. Um, we, we, uh, we calculate temperature, shade cover. Uh, we calculate a number of different bacterial um, and uh, different pollutants that uh, influence it. And once we kind of come up with that, we do a bunch of testing and then we go, okay, this, this waterway is impacted or this waterway is functioning normally. Um, when a waterway is impacted, one of the first things that we also compare it to is, is it a salmon habitat? Um, somebody, somebody a little while ago um, said in Washington, salmon is king. And I said, are you talking about king salmon? They said, no, I mean, salmon is king meaning that salmon is the way that you get um, a lot of funding, a lot of legal decisions. It's what a lot of municipalities and things are concerned about. And that is very true. Um, salmon is extremely important in Washington uh, for a number of different reasons. And one of the first things that sort of makes all of us jump up and say, we need to do something about this is when we realize that a salmon habitat is being impacted. Um, in this case, the Parent of the Watershed is a salmon habitat. Um, it is an infrequent salmon habitat, meaning that it's not perfectly regular, um, but it is an impacted salmon habitat. Uh, it is also a highly urbanized watershed. As you can see, this whole watershed is covered by um, suburban areas um, with only a few spots where you don't see streets attached to it. And that's okay. Um, it is urban. I'm, I'm an urban planner, um, and I do not believe that urban is a dirty word. Um, I believe that urban waters can be dirty. So um, when you are considering an urbanized watershed, you have to think, all right, where is the water coming from? Because it might not just be flowing normally, it might be being piped in from different places. Um, it's what we call a storm watershed. So where is this water really coming from? And where are the pollutants that are impacting these waterways coming from? Um, and that is what led us to um, the watershed impacts report. So 2016, um, along with Forterra and the city of Edmonds, and the Department of Ecology, we wrote a report. And this report said, uh, among other things um, having to do with tree canopy, uh, Perrinville is an impacted waterway and it would be a great, um, uh, a great candidate for some green stormwater infrastructure. And the two things that were called out were roadside gardens and private gardens, um, also called bioswales and rain gardens. So that is where we started. We said, let's see if we can find any places for roadside gardens or private gardens uh, that maybe can take some of this polluted stormwater and instead of discharging it to Perrinville where it can do some harm, allow it to infiltrate. So this is the project that we did last year. Um, it was a combination of right-of-way gardens and private gardens. A lot of these were um, done with uh, in conjunction um, or in partnership with both the city and some landowners um, who said, yes, as a matter of fact, I would love to have uh, some, some extra, uh, um, uh, some, some, some rain garden, some, some landscaping done in my front yard. And we said, fantastic, let's do it. Um, and then in other places uh, in the right of way where the city said, you know, we have an issue with uh, our existing storm drains or there's, you know, there's a lot of water that's coming through this. Is there something you can do? So we put in um, a, a truly enormous bioswale um, across several, uh, several homes. And in front of a few of them, we expanded into larger rain gardens. Um, on the top left there, you can see sort of the initial steps of the bioswale. We're taking the sod out there. And then in the middle, uh, you can see what it looks like after it's been excavated and had that uh, that's the specialized soil added back. That soil um, is really, um, uh, it's really special. So it's actually engineered um, with, uh, by the Department of Ecology um, and Cedar Grove, which is a local composter. Um, and it's a mix of compost and sand. And it's very specifically designed to allow for both um, the the, the support of plants that are going to help with both infiltration and evapotranspiration, um, and the fastest perk time possible. Um, it's going to allow water to move through it very quickly while retaining enough water to support the plants that are there. Um, and we do that because once that water gets flushed out, you know, we're trying to put a lot of water in a very small place. It's okay that it stays put for a little while, um, but you know, within 48 to 72 hours, we want it to be moving on its way. 
Um, 48 to 72 hours, some folks feels like a long time. Um, water will normally stay in places like this for days and days and days. We don't want that to happen. We want it to go ahead and be, be, be moving through. Uh, fortunately, these projects are great. Uh, the water does stay put for probably about 48 hours at a time um, after these really massive heavy rains that we've had. Um, but we've been really happy with how well and how fast it's been perking. Um, and then the, uh, you'll see kind of what the finished product looks like on the far right there, on the, yeah, on the far right, um, where the, it's, it's we, we haven't put the plants in, the plants are sort of the last fun bit, um, but you see this bioswale. Um, the top of, of that is covered with um, a specific kind of mulch uh, called uh, DOE Animal Safe Hogs Fuel. Um, if you want to know why it's called the hog's fuel, I love telling that story, but I'll only tell it if I'm asked. Um, it is a very fine shredded wood chip mulch that uh, forms, it's made of sap wood, um, and it forms these great mats, which um, both, they don't wash away when it, you know, water really gets moving. Um, they do a really good job keeping weeds down, and they also form a barrier uh, so the water can move through it one way, but doesn't move back up. It doesn't evaporate. It, it doesn't evaporate as well. It really keeps moisture in the ground, which is what we want to do. We want to keep the water in the ground and percolating. So there's sort of the three major steps um, to to doing one of these. Uh, unfortunately, the plants just got planted, um, so I don't have any photos of the, the little baby plants uh, starting to take off. In about a year or so, they will grow up um, and be massive. The plants just really love this rain garden mixed soil. So as I said, the stages of construction, excavation, we come out, we dig everything up. Um, then we, you know, we want to make sure that it's, it's to the right depth, it's the right shape, it you know, looks a certain way, um, and it's deep enough to, to, to handle what we're trying to do. Um, and we come in and we backfill with that specialized soil. Um, when I was a private landscaper, we had a joke um, about uh, government employees and government projects. Um, someone called a ditch digger and someone called a ditch filler. Um, and I always thought that was funny, you know, like, oh, haha, -ha, government inefficient. Um, and about a year ago, I realized that I am absolutely a ditch digger and a ditch filler. Um, I, I go out and I dig ditches and then I fill them right back in. But the, the important part is we fill them back in with that specialty soil, which is different than any soil you're going to find natively. Um, and so after we do that backfilling, we add the wood chip mulch over the top to kind of cap everything off and make sure that weeds don't come up or as, at least as few weeds as possible come up. Um, and then later we come back and we plant. And we come back and we plant later because we do these projects almost exclusively in the summer. And when we do these projects in the summer, they have a real um, chance of being too dry for the plants to really survive. So we wait until it gets a little bit cooler and a little bit wetter and the plants are a little bit more, do are more dormant um, because it increases their, their survival chance by a lot. Um, so after, after we do that, um, we unfortunately usually leave the, leave the project for about two months. Um, and it looks kind of just like, uh, like the last stage that you saw there with the wood chip over it. Um, we usually try to put in a sign that says like, hey, you know, coming soon, this is what it's gonna look like. And then we come back and we do the planting. Um, in the before times, back when we could do big uh, in-person events, um, we would have a, uh, a full community-wide event. We would ask people to come, uh, volunteers to come, and we would make a big day out of it. And it was just so much fun. Um, and we haven't been able to do those last year, obviously. Um, fingers crossed for this year. I'm not, I'm not, you know, I'm not counting my chickens, but uh, hopefully soon we'll be able to do those big events because um, they're just, they're a great chance to get your hands dirty. Uh, so again, I wanted to sort of uh, reiterate, this is what rain gardens look like when they're working. Um, a lot of people, they, you know, they see how beautiful they are in the summer when they're in full bloom, and that's great. But around here, um, you know, when, when a rain garden is really shining is uh, in the spring and in the, in the winter when, you know, water is just coming down. Um, so this is a, a, on the left, you'll see a bioswale. It's a community bioswale. Um, this is not in Washington. I believe this is Pennsylvania. Um, I'm not 100% certain, but I believe that's Pennsylvania. Um, and it is um, completely uh, soaking, sopping wet, which is fine. Water is moving the way that it should. Um, and that water will continue to infiltrate over, um, over the length of the, um, probably the next couple of days. 
Um, that water, critically different than just a normal rain garden, is taking water is taking um, water from the road as well. We really like bioswales and projects that take rain guard that, that take water from the road um, because that water is usually more polluted. Um, it's usually a lot more water. It's usually a lot more polluted. Uh, the water that's coming off of your roof is significantly cleaner. So we love the gardens that uh, we can put on the roadside to really gather up um, kind of the most polluted water that we have. Um, the uh, top there is another private rain garden. Um, it is uh, taking water probably from the roof, maybe from the driveway uh, of a private residence. Still, you see that ponding area. Um, I actually don't like the way that the plants um, are done on that one. I think the grasses need to be spaced out differently, but that's just me being a baby. Um, and, uh, and you see it down there in the ponding area. Um, the water's in that lower area. It's designed to hold it. Um, the whole topography of the garden, as well as the plant placement, is assuming that that area is going to be wet when it's raining uh, and slowly infiltrate over the next, uh, like I said, 24 to 48, maybe 72 hours. Uh, so here's the big sales pitch. Here's, uh, here's where I tell you about the, the, the timeshare you can get in Cabo. Um, not that any of us are traveling, traveling to Cabo right now. Um, we have some upcoming projects. We are going to do one more cluster um, in the Perrinville Basin, um, and it is going to be a series of private gardens, um, and we are uh, going to try to do somewhere between six to eight uh, private gardens, um, probably within the same roughly one block area. Um, you'll see on that map, that is a map from this report. If anybody's interested in reading this report, I would be more than happy to share it with you. It's, uh, um, it was done by are uh, in part by our wonderful engineer, Derek Hahn. Um, and in this, um, it shows you in, in blue are the best possible candidates, um, all the way down to green, which are the, the, the least uh, um, ideal candidates. So if you're looking at this and you go, hang on, I think my area is in blue, please give us a call because we would love to do some free landscaping for you. Um, we're doing this in conjunction with the city, um, the city of Edmonds. So if you are living in the city of Edmonds, um, you have a, a great shot to have this completely uh, completely paid for. How we will do this, um, we will try to determine uh, a cluster of between six to eight. We do that because if we can get a larger number of small gardens near each other, we can do them for less expensive and we can get some of your neighbors in on it as well. We will do the installation, we will pay for the plants, um, we will help you install the plants, and we will also help you maintain it for a little um, so if you are interested in rain gardens, if you've listened to this and said, oh my gosh, that sounds really cool. What an interesting feature. Um, what a cool piece of landscaping that none of my neighbors will have and I will get to act all uh, snooty because I know about GSI. Please give us a call. We would love to talk to you and see if there is a way that we can help. Um, my contact information is up on the screen. That is my cell phone number and my, um, because we're all working from home now, um, and my, um, my, email, my, my email address. Um, if you have any questions or if you would like to be considered uh, for, the, for this program, or maybe if you just have something completely unrelated but you're interested in, you think, you know what, I, I don't know if a rain garden will work for me, but I'm having an issue with standing water. Um, I'm wondering if somebody from the district can help me. Yes, yes we can. Um, we can come out and take a look. Um, if you're thinking, well, all of this is great, but I really care about native pollinators. That is something else that we do. We're more than happy to come talk to you about that. Um, if you're thinking, well, all of this sounds cool, but I don't want to pump it into the ground. I want to save my water because um, with you know, some kind of rain barrel, we can help with that. And I want to save it with a rain barrel because I want to use it to water my garden where I grow food. That is something else that we can help you with. We do all of those things and more. Um, so if you have any questions, please contact us or go ahead and ask me right now because I think we are about to open it up to questions from the audience. Kari? Yeah, I'm coming back in here. There are currently no questions, but maybe no questions. now okay. he's not talking so you can go, I have a question. I want to really get that down. I would like to point out to the audience that there was a cat interruption. I saw it. <laughs> I'm yeah. I'm so I have um, I have two little kittens. They're about they came home about two three months ago, um, and they just figured out that from one of their little habitat places, uh, they can make it onto the counter uh, that is my my standing desk currently, um, and they 
absolutely love interrupting meetings. Um, it's fun. I have older kids. No questions yet, but I, I know that, um, like David said, feel free to reach out to us. The website, it makes it pretty easy to find any of us on the staff page or, um, or by topic. And in the materials you received for this class too, it also had the link to the Rain Garden page, which will lead to David too, so. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'm curious um, if anyone watched our Facebook live stream, um, which was kind of fun to do too, um, but that's a good way to kind of take a look at that space. Double checking here. You know what I might do? I might yeah. do this um, in such a way. Hang on. One thing I would point out while he's looking for whatever he's looking for is um, Oh, contact information. Yeah, is that rain gardens do help orcas. A lot of people think because these rain gardens are far away from the sea mm -hmm. um, that they they don't do anything, but they do. David can explain it better than I. But so um, yeah, so this is this is one of the things that uh, rain gardens and rain catchments, um, any kind of stopping rainwater from just shooting right into the system, is a, is a huge help to, to salmon, um, and salmon are a huge help to orca. Um, so the way that these help, um, as I mentioned before, uh, these things can leach a lot of toxins, a lot of pollutants um, into waterways that are salmon spawning habitats um, that lead to mass salmon die off. Uh, mass salmon die off obviously means that there are fewer salmon for orcas to eat. Mm -hmm. uh, so, you know, there's the, 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 the main thing that is, that is harming orcas right now um, that the University of Washington is working on um, is figuring out, is, is, is trying to um, increase their total body mass. They're just running out of food. Um, their habitats are, you know, obviously heavily disrupted by boat traffic and things like that. But the number one is that these urbanized streams were not spawning nearly as much salmon. Um, and, and I want to be really clear that, you know, GSI are part of, they're part of a, uh, a whole host of things that need to happen in order to, to support ORCA. Um, it's uh, and, and and support salmon. Um, it's the, a, a, a huge issue that that uh, that salmon face spawning in a lot of these um, areas is temperature and shade uh, temperature dissolved oxygen and shade allocation. Rain gardens aren't going to help with any of those. Um, those are going to help by really reinforcing riparian sections, um, keeping them from being channelized, complicating them, planting trees. Um, it's, Pulling, pulling back so not developing right on a creek side um, to really allow those rivers to, to form more naturally and to flow more naturally. Uh, similarly, we, uh, we draw a lot of uh, water from wells, uh, which leads to uh, what DOEs refer to as low summer flows. And that's a problem because that's when salmon are trying to move through. Lower summer, uh, lower flows mean lower dissolved oxygen and lower uh, and, and higher temperatures, which are deadly to salmon. So, um, so yeah, there's, there, there's a number of things. The, the rain gardens are definitely helpful. They're helpful in a very specific way. If you're very concerned, um, if you find yourself really moved and concerned uh, by orcas and salmon, um, there's a lot of things that you can do locally in terms of advocacy or direct action uh, to ensure that uh, salmon habitat is protected and improved. I have a question for you, David. Who? Um... Yeah, from Denise. So uh, she says they live in Skagit County. Do we have access to any of these programs through our conservation district? Oh man, you guys have a great conservation district. Um, you guys have uh, you guys have some of my favorite people in your conservation district. Um, yes, yes, you do. Um, we actually just worked with um, uh, Skagit Conservation last year, um, doing some um, some rain garden stuff, um, and I. Yeah, well, we, we did a, a, a big install at a school and another one at Anacortes um, and uh, worked with uh, the executive director, Bill Blake, there, um, who, Bill, I, Bill Blake, I think, has forgotten more about stormwater than I've learned yet in my tenure. Um, he's, he's phenomenal. Um, so, yes, um, you should definitely uh, have access to some of these. If you tell them, you know, I listen to the Snohomish Conservation District uh, talk on, on GSI and I'm interested in the rain garden, 
um, and let them know that, you know, you came from us and that uh, Dave and Kari sent you, they will probably reach out to us <laughs> and say, hey, what, did it, what the heck did you tell these people? Um, and we can, uh, we can help uh, make sure that you get exactly what you're looking for. But yes, your, 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 conservation district, your conservation district actually taught me most of what I know about detention ponds. Um, so you guys have a great stormwater, uh, great stormwater program up there. Yeah, that's great. And we, we do, thank you, she says, very nice. Um, we do work regionally. Um, we try and as a general rule, conservation districts work together. So there's a lot of projects that cross mm -hmm. county lines. So I have another question for you. Um, yep. We would love to hear your story about why sapwood mulch is called hog's fuel. All right, so, um, <laughs> so this is this is this is this isn't a funny story. Um, this is a very, uh, but I find it really interesting. So this actually goes back to the old, uh, like lumber mill days, like the old warehouser days, where um, you know we're felling these giant trees and then like actually milling them on the spot. And the engines, the furnaces that ran these pocket mills, uh, these smaller mills, and the, um, uh, the, the, the trams and stuff that would move people back and forth were called hogs. Um, they were just a little more compact furnaces and they were called hogs. And uh, when you, so if, if, I don't know if anybody here has ever tried to mill a tree, um, but there's a lot of really great wood um, there's it's called the heartwood um, in the in, in the middle, which grain is really good, all this different stuff. But once you start getting out towards the edge, closer to the bark, uh, closer to what's called the sapwood, um, which is usually very wet and very stringy and very sugary, it's not as good for lumber. Um, it doesn't dry out as easy. Um, we have really great ways now of kind of treating that, but most of it is just kind of stringy and messy and nasty, and it's not great for a lot. Um, but because it is so sugar heavy, it is great for burning um, because it has lots of energy uh, in, the, um, uh, in the form of sugar um, that, that burns really easily. So they started stripping all of that out, keeping it aside, and then they would feed it to the hogs, the furnaces, uh, to help them run hotter. Um, so hence why they call it hogs fuel. Um, obviously, we don't do that anymore. Um, so what it's used for now is this really great mat forming um, uh, uh, wood chip mulch. I, for the longest time, did not know this and really believe, so what is commonly used for um, outside of what we use it for um, is animal paddocks. It's used for livestock um, because they won't eat it, um, but it also isn't sharp enough to really have any splinters. Um, and it's, it's fairly soft, um, so it can be used as bedding, but it's still really tough and it takes a long time to break down. So I thought it had something to do with that. I thought it was like pig lining or something along those lines. And I was like, oh, hog's fuel, it's a weird thing to call it. Like, why would you call it fuel? So I call it hog's lining. And there's like contractors, we have a thousand words for the same damn, I, you know, single product. Um, so I thought it was something along those lines. And it wasn't until I started here, um, actually, that uh, aforementioned engineer, Derek Hahn, uh, who was on this report, uh, told me the story of why it is called Hox Hogs Fuel. Well, maybe just to follow up to that, why don't we call, why don't we use beauty bark in a rain garden? Oh, why don't we use beauty bark? So, you, so beauty bark, um, it has a large number of what are called fines. Um, that's basically wood that gets very, very fine. Um, and people like that because it, it looks very smooth. Um, it looks more like kind of dark soil that we're used to. Hog's fuel is very distinct. Um, and some people really don't like the look of it. Beauty bark looks very um, smoothed out and, um, you know, kind of like, oh, this is just natural soil. The problem is, is that the reason, so I throw a lot of terminology at you here. Part of the reason that RGM, the soil that rain gardens were uh, work with, is so effective is what's called voids. Uh, and with voids, when you're when you're doing rain garden engineering um, and you're looking at a material, you want to determine the void space of a um, uh, of a soil because that is how much space there is for water to move through a soil. So fines are the are the antithesis of voids. Uh, they fill in those spaces. 
So if you get that stuff wet, the water is going to transport it down. It's basically going to kind of clog up the system. Um, so you don't want to do that. You also don't want to use any bark that has dyes in it um, because that's going to uh, do a similar sort of thing. I actually, in general, recommend not using bark that has dye in it um, as a rule. That seems reasonable. Yeah, I don't have any more questions in the Q&A oh. for you. So last call on questions, if you want to type something in. No, typing really fast. Yeah. <laughs> well, um, I will say I really appreciate everyone coming and hanging out with us. This was uh, a very chilled out kind of presentation. Um, if you are interested at all um, in joining that program with the city of Edmonds, please let us know. Um, we would be more than happy to have you. We're probably going to try to do that this summer. Um, so we will uh, we'll want to get moving on that fairly quickly. But if you have any other questions at all, um, even if you're not necessarily from Snohomish, but you're you know, wondering, you, you have some questions about GSI and wondering if maybe there's some, some direction you can get locally, please go ahead. Um, give us a call. Drop us an email. Um, ask some questions and we are more than happy to point you in the right direction. That is all of what we do. Oh, and something that Kari, I want to loop back real quickly, something that Kari said about us being non-regulatory. What that means when we say we're non-regulatory is that we are not ever going to get you in trouble for doing something. Um, you, we are a safe place to ask. Um, we figured out a long time ago that there's a lot of people that are accidentally breaking rules and then they're not asking any questions about them because they're afraid they're going to get in trouble in some way. Um, we are the solution to that. You can call us and say, hey, I think I might be breaking the rule. Can you help me? And we will say, we will be happy to help you uh, become compliant um, or to, to stop breaking whatever rule or to assuage your fears entirely without getting you in trouble. We are just here to help. So um, that's among everything else. should also encourage you, if you have any questions, if you have any concerns, please reach out to us. We are here to help. Absolutely. And plant sale season, oh, that's my last push. If you want plants, buy them now. Um, Skagit, if you're up there, has their own sale too, which is usually later than ours. So that would be coming, but they're all over the region right now. And our, our trees are little, but they will grow up. And after this week's rainstorm, I would say, um, let's get some more trees back in the ground because they do good work for us, so. Yes, absolutely. All right. Oh, and uh, we have, I think, probably this year only, hopefully this year only, um, I heart native plant masks. Yes. Um, yeah, I have already bought two. <laughs> you, <Did I? laughs> if you want, if you want some, if you're looking for some cool masks that almost nobody else is going to have, you can get them from us. Yeah, and I love native plant stickers too. So. Yes, I have about a thousand. Yeah, that's awesome. Well, thank you so much, David, uh, for your information. And by all means, again, please reach out to us if you have any questions at all. Uh, I will be sending this recording to everybody uh, who registered and then also we'll post it on our YouTube channel so and the website so you'll be able to get to it later. So thank you so much, everybody, for coming. I'm going to stop the recording and then we'll end the webinar. Thanks. Thanks, everyone.